Welcome to the stage, Anais Dawson, please. Well, hi ladies and gentlemen. I've just got wind of the fact that I'm closing off today. So I'm very sorry because there's a lot of G.G. Martin accidentally slipped into my talk in terms of theme. But we'll do our best not to finish the night on a sad note. Anyway, let me take you back to 1922 when Grace Fryer goes to the dentist with wobbly teeth and a sore jaw. And if that weren't terrifying enough for your dentist visit, after a quick x-ray, she realised that her jaw was fully decayed and full of tiny little holes. She was actually the first of many cases that popped up around the area. The most severe might have been Frances Spetterstocker, who came in to have a tooth removed, and when she had it removed, part of her jaw came out with it. She died a month later, and she was only 21. Of course, dentists started talking to each other, wondering what was behind all of this, and it didn't take long to find the common denominator. All of the patients were women, and all of them were either current or former workers at US Radio. Now, between you and me, I guess after hearing Bob's talk, you know you shouldn't be going bananas over radio, <laughs> but it's still pretty bad to mix radioactive materials, unsuspecting employees, and a nation that basically is currently unaware that radioactive material is bad for you. And indeed, at the time, no one actually knew that radio, radium, or radioactive material for that matter, was dangerous. In fact, quite the opposite. So let's go back a bit further, rewind to, nine, to 1898, which is back when Marie Curie was studying the radioactive elements. And at the time, uranium, polonium, and radium attracted a great deal of interest. But radium was always the most popular of the three. Because you see, uranium is actually has quite trap and fashionable. <laughs> It doesn't really glow very much, and that's because it has a very, very long half-life on the order of several billions of years. On the other hand, polonium was pretty surprising because it has a really short half-life. In fact, it burns out within a year. <laughs> However, radium was always on the sweet spot. This does say, this does say radium. With a half-life of 1,600 years, Radium stood out to everyone. It had a pale green and blue glow, and most importantly, it glowed in the dark. And if any of you have ever clicked onto Pinterest, you all know that people love shit that glows in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and the people from 100 years ago thought the same as we did, and virtually overnight, radium was everywhere. All kinds of cosmetic products, perfumes, lipsticks, facial powders, then the men wanted in on it and suddenly there were radioactive condoms and lightsabers in the bedroom. <laughs> um, then the doctors also decided they could get in on this and you had radioactive eye drops and suppositories. But anyway, we actually have an expression in Spanish when something is everywhere, we say que estás en la sopa, which basically means that it's even in your soup. And guess what? That's not even far from the truth. There was a guy a doctor, by which I mean a Harvard dropout, called William Bailey, who invented an elixir called Radithor. Now, Radithor is basically distilled water with a little bit of radium and thorium, though he guarantees at least a microcurie of each. <laughs> now, if that's not homeopathy's dangerous cousin, then I don't know. <laughs> In spite of that, he unfortunately is only notorious because this product actually killed someone. There was an athlete called Eva Myers who, complaining of arm pain, drank over 1,400 of these bottles and subsequently died of radium poisoning. But anyway, we're kind of really veering off topic here. There's another place where radium managed to sneak its way onto, and those were clocks. William Hammer discovered that if he mixed zinc salts, no, sorry, radium salts along with zinc sulfide, he was able to make a special paint, which he could basically apply to any surface, and voila, it glows in the dark. And US Radium pounced on this idea, and suddenly, overnight, radium clocks were the new in thing. And the company took great pride in hiring all of these working class women and paying them decent salaries for painting clock dials. They even recommended to them that, you know, just point the paintbrush with your lips to make yeah. the details as fine as possible. The only side effect 
you'll have some rosy cheeks, or maybe some glow-in-the-dark cheeks. Now, as you may imagine, as soon as teeth start falling out of people, you realise that something's going on. And that is when people decided to start investigating. A man called Dr. Frederick Flynn approached Grace Fryer and said he was interested in examining her and finding out about her case. So after what was possibly the shortest examination she had ever had, he concluded that she was fine, that her that swollen jaw she had, that would get better, no worries, and oh, that had nothing to do with radium. It soon emerged that this guy was a minion employed by US radio, and by the way, he was not a doctor after all. So anyway, let's, let's kind of, you know, bring the mood down a bit further and continue to discuss what happens when you come into contact with radium. The girls didn't just have trouble with their jaws. Many of them actually later had trouble with their bones. They developed bone cancer. I seem to be having feedback as well. Um, they began to develop bone cancer, leukemia. One of them was dancing on the, on the dance floor and she tripped. She didn't even fall, but somehow she snapped her leg in mid-air. Grace, who at the time was proclaimed as being well and fine and still pretty by US radio, actually was bedridden and could only sit up wearing a back brace. Clearly things were not going well. So what happens when you come into contact with radium? Because paradoxically, if I had one of those watches here with me, which they were available up to about 50 years ago, I think, I could wear it and I'd be fine. And I could give it to any of you and you'd all be fine. And they're just as radioactive as they were 80 years ago. And it's to do with the type of radiation that the radium emits. So you see, you can get three basic types of, radi um, of radio radioactive particles being emitted. You can have alpha radiation, beta, or gamma. Alpha particles are the heaviest, so they actually don't travel very far. Three centimetres of air, or a layer of skin, or of paper will do the job of blocking these particles. For something like beta rays, you're going to, beta rays, I'm going off story here, of beta particles, you're going to need something like glass, or maybe, um, or glass, or maybe a layer of aluminium foil. And if you have gamma, those are the real bad boys, and you're going to need Jace's steel spoon for that. <laughs> but anyway, radium, fortunately for most, actually mostly emits alpha particles, so the watch on my skin isn't going to do anything at all to me. The trouble comes when you ingest it, which is what happened to Eva Myers when he was drinking Vadifor, or what happened to the radium girls as they were painting. When radium gets inside your body, you no longer have that layer of skin protecting you from the alpha particles. And each time one is emitted, it knocks out around half a million electrons, which is a lot, but basically it causes DNA mutations, which leads to cancer, and it also destroys cells, which leads to necrosis, and basically a body that doesn't want to work anymore. The other really unfortunate thing about radium is that it's chemically very similar to calcium. If you remember from the periodic table, calcium is there, and radium is at the bottom. So the body, because it's not really expecting to encounter radium, think, ah, oh, that's just calcium looking a bit different. And it incorporates it into the bones. Just instead of making it stronger, it obviously makes it weaker as it gets a permanent position and starts destroying everything in its surroundings. A bit like the political situation in our country. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, back to the main story. Once Frederick Flynn's cover was blown, it was clear that US Radium really had to clear their name this time they asked Dr. Cecil Drinker to come. And I will stress, this is the first actual medical doctor we've had so far in this story. And finally, five years into this story, he is called onto the scene. He is asked to do a very thorough report of the surroundings and a very thorough report of the girls. And indeed, he is thorough and objective, and US <coughs> Radium do not like this. In fact, they absolutely don't like this, that his report is completely rewritten and swept under the rug. But when you look underneath that rug, you find out that everything is glowing in the dark. <laughs> their hair glows in the dark, their teeth glow in the dark, and unfortunately the bones of those who passed away also glow in the dark. And as soon as Cecil Drinker caught wind of the fact that his report had been rewritten, there was no bribe large enough that US Radium could offer him for his silence. So he published it, things actually quite slowly began to change. US Radium did everything they could to squirm out of their responsibility of compensating the 100 girls who were affected by this workplace hazard. However, 
eventually they did win the case, though <coughs> there is a slight positive. And most importantly, they introduced major changes to how their factory ran. First of all, they forbade lip, pain, lip pointing, and that was the moment from which no more deaths could be immediately attributable to radium. But it also contributed to a bill that was passed in 1949. That means that all states in the United, uh, all companies in states in the US are liable to compensate their workers. I am very aware that this is a very bittersweet ending. <laughs> And when I was writing this, I really didn't want to change that because I don't think there's any point in diminishing it. However, I thought of something to lighten the mood a bit. I was asked before what my favorite, what my second favorite element was, and I realized I didn't actually have a favorite one. I just thought radium was cool. So actually, thinking about it, radium is indeed really quite cool. Not just for the history that we've just learned about it, but also it is actually the largest discovery ever made by a PhD thesis to science. I'm sorry to all PhD students out there, but it is always going to remain the biggest discovery of PhD thesis <laughs> to science. And I also think it kind of lives up to the cliche. Everything, even those that shine the brightest, hold a dark, dark side. Thank you for listening. I'm Elise Dawson. Have a great night.